The route to superior performance has to be thinking differently and thinking better. To do better, you have to get up to a higher level of thinking. I think of the pandemic as a meteor from space that hit the Earth. None of this is meant to be easy, and anybody who thinks it's easy is stupid. I think pe most people trade too much, and most trading is in error. Uh, I said, in the real world, things fluctuate between pretty good and not so hot, but in the markets, psychology goes from flawless to hopeless. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time you're listening to this episode. My name is Samuel Ponsoni. I'm a Fund of Funds Portfolio Manager at XP Investments, and this is not one more episode of Outliers. This is the episode of Outliers, because today we're going to interview one of the greatest investors of all times, Howard Marks, who is the co-founder and co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital Management. Howard, in the name of XP, thank you very much for being with us. It's great to be here, Samuel. Right now, I'm attending the biennial conference of Oak Tree here in Los Angeles, California. And to help me in this conversation with Howard, I have Mariana Biazzi, who is the responsible for the fund research department at XP Investments. Mari, thank you for being with me here. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure being here. And Howard, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Maria. And finally, I would like to thank Bernardo Queima, who is partner and CEO at HCM Itajubá, the company that first brought Oak Tree funds to be distributed in Brazil, and also was responsible for setting up this meeting with Howard. Unfortunately, he, he couldn't join us here in Los Angeles, but sent some good questions for Howard anyway. For those who don't know very well yet, Oak Tree was founded by Howard Marks and Bruce Karsh in 1995 and throughout the years evolved to become one of the largest asset management houses in the world, with more than 1,000 employees and more than $160 billion in assets under management, focused mainly in credit and distressed debt funds. It also has funds dedicated to private equity, real estate, infrastructure, listed equities, but credit funds account for around 60 to 70% of all the assets they manage. Besides being the co-founder and co-chairman at Oak Tree, together with Bruce Karsh, Howard is very known not only for the superior returns that he and Bruce have delivered to the clients in 27 years history of Oak Tree, but also for writing the famous memos from Howard Marks which are letters that Howard sends to his investors talking about a wide range of topics that has led to great discussions in the investment industry, ranging from macroeconomic analysis applied to investments and his disbelief in it, the concept of risk, value investing versus growth investing, and dozens of different topics that cover the wide range of a wide range of themes that are important for anyone who wishes to become a better investor. He also published two books, The Most Important Thing, which was translated to dozens of idioms around the world, and Mastering the Market Cycle. There is definitely a lot of subjects to cover about Howard Oak Tree and about what they think of the markets, and we will try to scratch a little portion of it in the next precious minutes. For those who want to get more information about the history of Howard Oak Tree and his funds available for Brazilian investors, we recorded one special short episode of Outliers talking specifically about it, and it works as, as a complementary episode to this conversation we're going to have with Howard. Uh, so, uh, let's get started. Uh, Howard, just to get warmed up, uh, in spite of being very known in the market, uh, could you please tell us how would you describe your current ro role at uh, Oak Tree? How do you and Bruce Karsh divide the responsibilities of running such a big institution like yours? Given my advanced age, I have uh, transitioned out of specific day-to-day -day responsibilities. So uh, most of what I do is uh, what I say, I, I think, I read, I speak, I write. Uh, I write the memos uh, and, and uh, you know, want to... Uh, I, I spend a lot of time making sure all of our communications are at a high level because we want people to understand what we're doing and why. And um, uh, I, I, my most tangible role is helping uh, Oak Tree decide how to position itself vis-a-vis -vis the macro. And, and in my opinion, that means 
where should the balance be between offense and defense at any given point in time? Like a strategist. Yes. And Howard, the history behind of why you decided to write the book, The Most Important Thing, uh, is a very interesting one that uh, the title of the book suggests there is one single most important thing to invest. And yet, as you read on the book, uh, there, there is no one magic formula. Uh, you talk about 21 important things. Well, that's the thing about investing is that, 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 that there is no one most important. There are many bases to be covered. Uh, and uh, you, you, have to, you have to cover them all. I would sit in clients' offices and I would say the most important thing is to buy cheap. And then five minutes later I would say the most important thing is to not lose money. And then five minutes after that I would say the most important thing is to be, have a viewpoint which is different from the crowd. So in, in 02 I think I wrote a memo titled the most important thing and then uh, I always thought I would pull my philosophy together into a book uh, when I retired. But then I got a letter from Warren Buffett in 09 saying, if you'll write a book, I'll give you a quote for the jacket. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was enough to accelerate my time schedule. That's good and, motivation. Uh, yes. And we brought the book out in 2011, as you say, 21 chapters. Each chapter says the most important thing is, and then it's a different thing um, because there are so many bases to cover. Out of the 21 most important things, maybe you, you have one that you consider more important than the others. What would be? I think risk is the most important of all. And in fact, the topic of risk has three chapters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understanding risk, recognizing risk, controlling risk. And I think that the, the superior investor is superior because he or she has a superior understanding of risk. And it's easy to make money in the markets, especially true when the markets go up, which is most of the time. To me, th the key question is, how do you do when the markets don't go up? And uh, you know, people who are just uh, surfing on aggressiveness do very well when the market goes up and very badly when the market goes down. And I think the goal, the proper goal for an investor at my level is what I call asymmetry. You want to go up a lot when the market goes up, but you don't want to go down a lot when the market goes down. And, and so to me, the key to that is risk control. And risk control is number one uh, on the six tenets of Oak Tree's investment philosophy. Great. When, when talking about doing things that uh, people uh, are not doing. Uh, what are the attributes that uh, you would consider when, uh, when asking yourself the question, who doesn't know that yet? Yes. Well, uh, who doesn't know that? That comes from uh, conversations that I had with my son. Um, he was in college. He was intending to become a, an investor. He's now a, an investor. He's a venture capitalist, very successful, and uh, does gr great uh, fundamental research. But he would come home from college, he would say, Dad, I think we should buy Ford stock because they're going to bring out a great new Mustang. And my answer was always the same as a teaching device. Who doesn't know that? Because if you're going to be a superior investor, you have to see things differently from, from the consensus. If you see everything the same as they do, then you'll probably behave the same and you'll perform the same. The route, the route to superior performance has to be thinking differently and thinking better. Mm -hmm. Thinking differently is not enough because if you think differently and worse, then you're in trouble. And you can't think differently just for the sake of thinking differently. It has to be, you have to hold different opinions from the consensus for a reason. But if you do, and if you're correct, that's how you make the big money in investing. And it all depends on what I call variant perception. You see things differently from others. And uh, you know, in the book, uh, Columbia University published the book and they said to me, could you give me a sample chapter? So I sat down, I wrote out the, f the first chapter. I wrote uh, something that I had never uh, formally thought about before, never had written about, and, and really never maybe had 
had thought about it at all in terms of a clear presentation, and that is second level thinking. First level thinking, which most people engage in, is very superficial. To do better, you have to get up to a higher level of thinking. Uh, the example I give in the book is that the first level thinker says, this is a great company, we should buy the stock. But the second level thinker says, it's a great company, but it's not as great as everybody thinks, so the price is probably too high, we should sell the stock. And that's the difference between first level and second, which I think is the most important thing. About investment philosophy, you wrote several times uh, that you don't believe in macro forecasting nor market timing. Uh, this was very clear, clear in one of your last memos, thinking about macro, where you said that you approach macro forecasts with high level of skepticism. Uh, you don't have macroeconomic, a macroeconomic department at Oak Tree. You spend little time talking to third party macroeconomists in general. Uh, but on the other hand, Timing capital deployment may be crucial to credit and distressed investments. Uh, if the investments made too early, valuations may not be as low as they could. And if the investments made too late, the opportunity may disappear altogether. So my question is, how do you balance the weight of the macro scenario and bottom-up approach at Oak Tree? Could you explain to our listeners, both actual and prospective clients in Brazil, a little bit better the investment philosophy at Oak Tree? I mentioned that we have six tenets to our investment philosophy. Number five is that we're, our investment actions are not based on macro forecasts. Number six is that we don't raise and lower cash to time the markets. You're right, Samuel. In, in, opportunities become better and worse. Uh, and it's important to strike when the opportunities are at their best. The key is we don't do it on the basis of forecasts because I, I, don't, I don't know anybody whose forecasts are better than anybody else's, and, and that includes my own. I have opinions. I only don't uh, bet that they're correct. So if not forecast, then what? And the answer is we, be, we act in response to current conditions, not what we think is going to happen in the future, but you know, what's happening today. So, for example, we've been very good at increasing our degree of aggressiveness at a time when others are panicked, depressed, and selling without discipline. That's a great time to buy. And we turn more cautious when everybody else is euphoric and optimistic and buying with both hands. Well, I think you would agree that that sounds like a good program. Buy when people are uh, depressed and sell when people are euphoric. None of that requires uh, okay. forecasts. It's all in response to what's going on at the present time. The other thing, of course, is that our buying, we buy when we find bargains. And, we, we you know, as a value investment firm, we have a quantitative approach to value. You look at a situation, you figure out what the company can earn in future years and, and, and what that's worth. That determines your actions. Uh, and that's the micro. That's studying companies and industries and securities, which I think we can do, bottom up, so-called. And so, uh, you know, uh, in, in the, where after Lehman Brothers went, bankrupt in the global financial crisis, uh, September 15th, 08, we swung into action. Uh, we invested as a firm, uh, I think an average of 650 million a week for 15 weeks, 10 billion, between September 15th and the end of the year. Not because we had a positive forecast, because we saw bargains. We saw things, securities being thrown away at ridiculously low prices. The forecast, was that the world financial system could melt down. It's not very helpful. And, uh, you know, it, we saw Bear Stearns go under, Merrill Lynch ba uh, rescued, uh, then we saw Lehman, et cetera, AIG went bankrupt. I couldn't prove to you that the financial system wouldn't end, but I did conclude that if it ended, what we did didn't matter. 
What mattered was that if it didn't end and we hadn't bought, th then we didn't do our job for our clients. So we swung into action very decisively and we got great bargains. Great, great. Having nothing to do with the forecast. Just to, to talk about the current, uh, where we are in the current cycle, we, just, we have just gone through a global pandemic that brought the world to a screeching halt. Uh, to control the, the coronavirus, and after that we've had Russia and Ukraine, uh, the war outbreak, which has completely messed up the economic, the economic cycle. That said, and you have a book dedicated to that, uh, where, where do you think we are in the market cycle? And taking as context our, our previous question, uh, what uh, are you seeing bargains uh, in the market given uh, the chaos that we have gone through as of late? It's important to acknowledge that whereas I wrote a book about cycles, what we've seen in the last two years has not been an ordinary cycle. Normal cycles occur because people become too optimistic and managements uh, expand too much and investors pay too much and then it turns out that their optimism is not fully warranted so things turn down and then we get a correction now Managements don't expand, then investors sell instead of buy, and we get downward movement until we reach a low. It's all internal to the economy and the market. This, as you point out, was external. It was the pandemic, it, and then Ukraine, of course. It was, I think of the pandemic as, as a, a, a meteor from space that hit the earth. You know, it had nothing to do with economy and, and, and markets and cycles. Uh, and so, um, you know, you can't uh, really apply cyclical thinking here. But the Fed and the Treasury did a very good job, uh, as did many central banks around the world, of injecting liquidity and bringing the economy back to life after it had been put it, voluntarily put into a coma, as you say, to fight the pandemic. We saw good economic strength, very strong growth. You know, the second quarter of 20. 20 was the worst quarter in our history, uh, down 34% on an annualized basis, but the third quarter was the best quarter in our history, up by a similar amount. Um, and yes, the, the economy was growing, and of course that contributed to the bull market in stocks. Uh, but then uh, people who watch cycles uh, and, and root for growth sometimes forget that if the growth is too strong, we can get inflation, which we have. We had, we had swollen incomes due to the stimulus checks, and we had uh, shrunken supply due to the economy having been shut down for so long. And uh, you know, when you have uh, more money chasing a limited supply of goods, that's the formula, that's the classic formula for inflation. So we now have inflation. And uh, so now the Fed, after being expansive, uh, for a long time and then really uh, injecting stimulus in the pandemic. Now the Fed has to reverse course and raise interest rates, stop buying bonds and so forth. Um, so uh, the good news about our economy is that we are only two years into this economic expansion and economic expansions usually go about eight years on average. The average, you know, it, the average is not dependable, but that's roughly the norm. Uh, but now, with the Fed tightening up on money, uh, we may have a very much below average economic recovery. Some think, people think we'll have a recession this year, some think next year, some think the year after. I would say most economists think we'll have a recession. So if they're right, then we're not getting to eight years. And you have to, you have to think about that. Uh, but you know, uh, especially because uh, of these external factors, uh, the market is hard to figure out today. But I want to point out to your uh, viewers that it's always hard. And people should, not, you know, people get into trouble when they underestimate the difficulty of what we're talking about here. And most people can't time. Uh, most professionals can't time. Uh, when I was working on my book, uh, I, I said to my son, you know, I think my, my market calls have been correct. He said to me, Dad, 
that's because you did it five times in 50 years. <laughs> five times in my career, the market has been so high or so low, like post Lehman, that it was compelling to become more aggressive or more defensive. And, and they worked. In between, not so. So, if, it, you know, it, here and here, you, you can do these things reasonably, or, or I did. Here and here, not so much. Here and here, not at all. You know, uh, so if I, had, if I had tried to tr do this a hundred times in my career, twice a year, I would have been a disaster because, <laughs> because it's very common for the market to be overpriced and go up or underpriced and go down. Only at the extremes is the market highly likely to come down or go up. And so most people shouldn't try, and they certainly shouldn't try very often. Uh, so we're, and by the way, we're not at an extreme today, especially after the correction of the last few months. You mean we are not in the extreme? You, you mean we can go further down? Yes, uh, but we don't have to. Mm -hmm. But we're not, so, we're not so high that we have to go down, but we're not so low that we can't go down. Okay. And that's the, that's the key. So... I, I, you know, at Oak Tree, we have essentially a normal posture today. We're not, a, you know, the, the real question, you know, they say buy, sell, or risk on, risk off. This is not a good formulation. For me, the, 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 the way to think about this, and, and I think your, your viewers should think about it this way, is should you be more aggressive than normal or more defensive than normal today? And I think you should be about normal. There are, there are difficult factors like uh, the inflation and the possibility of recession and, and the possibility of tight money and the war in Ukraine. And, but on the other hand, we have, we're early in the economic recovery. Um, I think that the, even if the Fed raises rates, the, we'll still be, have rates some of the lowest in history. And low rates are very stimulative. And, and we've had a significant correction. So, Things are much cheaper than they were three months ago. Mm -hmm. You put these factors together, you know, maybe, maybe if you're very concerned with avoiding downward fluctuations, you want to uh, overweight defense a little bit, but certainly not at an extreme. Great, great. In the end of November 2021, uh, during a conversation we had at InfoMoney event, uh, me and Juliana, I asked your opinion about whether inflation could be transitory or not, and you said that it was very hard to know at yes. that time. Yes. Six months have passed, and I would like to ask you the same question. Uh, what about now? Are you guys at Oak Tree worried about inflation at this point of the economic cycle, or do you think the worst is already behind us? Let's go back a few questions and bear in mind our lack of interest in forecasts. And so, look, I think that inflation in the coming five years will be above the level of the last 40 years, mm -hmm. when we couldn't get to two, will be less than today's eight, but I think it will be, I don't know, maybe three or four. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to do anything about that. We're going to look at the outlook for individual companies and industries and make our investment decisions it's not on a that basis. It's for you guys. It's, it's a concern, but it's not something we can intelligently do anything about. You know, I was talking to Warren Buffett one time several years back, and he says to me, for a piece of information to be desirable, it has to satisfy two criteria. It has to be important, and thinking about the direction of inflation is very important, and it has to be knowable. Nobody knows anything about the future of inflation. And so if I were to become defensive because I think inflation at eight is here to stay, or aggressive because I think it's going to go back from eight to two, I would subject my clients' portfolios to the possibility of being very, very wrong. Mark Twain, the American humorist, said, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that just ain't true. So if I say I don't know about inflation and I'm not going to make a bet on inflation, 
I'm unlikely to get into trouble. If I say I'm confident that inflation is here to stay or going away, and I'm wrong, and I bet on that confidence, and I'm wrong, that's how you lose a lot of money. And, and so I, I think it's very, very important for people to, to realize that our guesses about the future are not helpful unless they're solidly grounded. And to, to, to say, well, you know, I think inflation is going to go up and sell you all your stocks, big mistake, could be a big mistake. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I say in the, in the Cycles book, uh, unrelated to Cycles, but I, it's something I feel strongly, is that everybody, including the three of us, should recognize that different expectations or expectations on different subjects should be the source of different degrees of confidence. We're in Los Angeles. Every day is a beautiful day. So if I say to you, what do you think the weather will be tomorrow? You say, sunny in the 70s. You are 90% likely to be right. If I say, do you think stocks will go up or down over the next 10 years? You say, I'm sure they're right. But if I say, what about two years? You say, I think they'll go up. You may be, uh, you know, 70% uh, chance to be right. But if I say, what do you think the market's going to do next week? Your answer to that question, if you're lucky, you're 50-50. Flip a coin. Mm -hmm. So different questions should produce expectations with differing levels of confidence. And people should know that when they're talking about inflation, which is, I find, highly mysterious, it, they should not have confidence in, in their forecasts or anybody else's. Right. I certainly don't have confidence in mine. And, and Howard, given the huge amount of liquidity uh, and capital that remains present in the economy, do you believe there's still any asset class, be there in the fixed income sector or equity sector, that still s stands in a bubble-like uh, state? You know, I think, uh, Maria, that most of the excesses have been driven out. The Fed's actions produced excesses. They put too much money in the hands of investors. And by re reducing the return on cash to zero, they made the investors too eager to put the money to work. And I think that's over now. And I think that the, the prices were driven to high levels. And now I think they've come off. You know, the, the, let's see. The, uh, the last time I looked, which is over the weekend, I think the S&P was down about 15%. Uh, for the year to date, and the NASDAQ was down 22. And, uh, you know, if you look at a list of the prominent stocks like Carvana and Uber and things like that, I think they're down like two thirds from the high. So uh, I think that the, uh, the words are important. The obvious excesses are, have been driven out. That, I'm not saying they're going up from here, yeah. but, but uh, I think there's nothing that which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, stands out as being really high. Um, on the other hand, you know, Buffett says, and I guess that's probably the third time I've quoted Buffett <laughs> in this discussion, but he, he, ha he has so many, ha so many good ways of saying things. He says, I eat hamburgers, and when hamburgers go on sale, I eat more hamburgers. <laughs> so, so compared to three months ago, some things have been put on sale. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, you get to buy stocks of some companies which have a lot of merit in the growth area, which are two thirds off. And some of them will, 10 years from now, some of them will prove to be great things. Some of them, of course, will not. That's, that's why this isn't easy. And by the way, I meant to mention something when I was talking to you about relying on forecasts. Uh, and this is from Charlie Munger, Warren's partner. Uh, Charlie shouldn't be left out. And when I was finishing my first book, The Most Important Thing, and I had lunch with him, uh, I got up to go, and he says, remember one thing, none of this is meant to be easy, and anybody who thinks it's easy is stupid. That's Charlie. He's very blunt. 
But the truth is, it's the not easy. At the very e beginning of the book, you yeah. can quote him. Oh, good. Yeah. But it's not easy. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we don't do our own uh, legal work. We don't do our own uh, medical work, dental work. Uh, most of us don't even fix our own cars. Uh, so people should realize that they, most people should not do their own investing. They should either go into managed products or put their, uh, uh, put their capital with a, with a manager who can help them. Even mm. though it's, it's interesting how people insist to do that. Yeah. In Brazil, in the U.S., yes. a lot more. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's funny that Howard mentioned that the last time that you took a look at the S&P was over the weekend. Yeah. And uh, there are probably so many viewers here, and, well, we're guilty of that sometimes, of looking at markets every single day. Yeah, so and, 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 you know, uh, Maria, it's, it can be a, an error in the fact that it can number, take your mind off thinking about the long term, and it can make you hyperactive. Uh, why, you know, you're not going to sell your stocks tomorrow, so why look at the price? And if you sell your stocks tomorrow with the market down as it is, it's, it could be a mistake. Uh, I think pe most people trade too much, and most uh, trading is in error because people get excited when things are going well and prices are high and they buy, and they get depressed uh, uh, when things are going badly and they sell at low prices, which is, of course, the opposite of what you should do. You should buy at low prices, and if you're going to do anything, sell at high prices, but certainly not the reverse. So I think that hyper-trading and short-term focus on the markets is, is not uh, advantageous. So, Howard, looking ahead in a, at a high level, what do you think are the biggest risks that investors face today? That question depends on what they consider important. Most people would say that the biggest risk is a decline related to uh, inflation uh, and bad economic news. But that, in my experience, is a temporary problem. I think the biggest risk is to not be in the market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the market, economies and markets have a positive underlying trend. We know there are cycles around that trend, mm -hmm. but underlying, we have a positive trend. For example, I think it's accurate to say that for the last 90 years, the S&P 500 index has gained about 10% a year. And I think that if you invested a dollar 90 years ago, and you still have it in today, I think you have about $8,000. This is compounding, and this is if you think about it that way, it's certainly a process you don't want to interrupt. Um, and I think that's the risk. So if, 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 if one of your viewers says now, well, I, I want to sell some stocks because I'm worried about the uh, inflation and tight money and Ukraine. Fine, sell your stocks. When are you going to get back in? Hmm. And and uh, Charlie Munger always talks about the fact that this is a two-decision action because you have to decide to get out and then you have to decide to get back in. Yeah. And if you don't get back in and you don't participate in the long-term benefits, uh, th then you've made a big mistake. Um, the other thing is, uh, when you look at the history of the market, for any given period, you say, well, the average return is 10%. But you'll find that, let's say it's a 10-year period, you'll find that the vast majority of the gains, or a very large part of the gains, were, were earned on 20 days out of 10 years. So if you jump in and jump out and, 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 and spend t time out of the market, you may miss those 20 days. Nobody knows when they're coming. Obviously, if, they, if anybody knew when they were coming, they would pile in, but if they knew they were coming, they would be anticipated so they wouldn't come. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess to just uh, to beat this dead horse, the way I would say it is, your expectations should be modest. Your opinion of your own abilities to time these things should be modest. If you stand at a bus stop long enough, you'll get a bus. If you run 
from bus stop to bus stop, you may never get a bus. And I think that that's very important. And it, it, people should not overestimate their abilities in this regard, both retail clients and professionals. And they should act accordingly. And one of the, by the way, in the later edition of The Most Important Thing, which is called The Most Important Thing Illuminated, we, we added a 22nd chapter. Oh, I don't get, I don't. I yeah, I don't. take a look at the end. Chapter 21 okay. says, I think. Putting it all together. Here, together. Let, let me take a look. No, no, not that one. That's the, that's, that's the summary. That's, that should be 20, oh, 21. But 20 says, the most important thing is reasonable expectations. Right, yes. So to expect that you're going to get out in a timely fashion and in in a timely fashion is not reasonable. And that's why I argue uh, against uh, it. You said something like the, the real achievement of great investors mm. is not just getting good returns, but getting good returns while taking less risk, that risk, less risk than the average of the market, yes. which is what you would call taking advantage of asymmetries. Right. Uh, where do you see the biggest asymmetry in the market currently, if any? As oh. I said to Maria, uh, Samuel, the, you know, the, the excesses have been driven out, most of them, I think. Uh, most things seem reasonably priced. Uh, you know, three or nine months ago, they might have been overpriced. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know if they're underpriced, but so, you know, look, uh, Oak Tree is a credit firm, and we tend to buy, you know, uh, for example, high yield bonds. Uh, a few months ago, high yield bonds were yielding in the threes of percent, and today it's in the sixes. And um, I think that six is a reasonable yield. Um, and, uh, you know, when they were three, you couldn't make a strong case for them. But most investors have a goal uh, of more than three. Mm -hmm. uh, but at six, now you're talking about something legitimate. So when you talk about an asymmetry, the beauty of bonds, and most, I don't you know, most, most people should make sure that they accurately understand the difference between a stock and a bond. A bond is a promise to pay from the company you give them money, they give you interest every six months, and they give you your money back at the end. And it's contractual. And they must do it, or else they go bankrupt and they lose the company. Mm -hmm. A stock is, is, is only an interest in what's left after everybody else gets paid. So first the, the suppliers get paid, the workers get paid, the bondholders get paid, the banks get paid. If there's anything left, then that's for the account of the, of the equity holders, the stockholders. So there's a big existential difference in these two things. And I, in 1978, I switched from being a stock investor to being a bond investor at Citibank, mm -hmm. where I worked at the time. And I was, my eyes were opened because now you're investing in things where you're promised a return. And that's why we call it fixed income. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a portfolio of a, in a well-selected portfolio of bonds, you can you should be able to earn the interest rate every year, and you shouldn't have much downside, especially if you're willing to hold it to maturity. Remember that they promised you your money back at the end. Now, if there are defaults, that would interfere with the process. Your return wouldn't be what you had hoped for, but if it's a diversified portfolio, uh, one or two defaults uh, won't kill you. And this is the premise under which Michael Milken established uh, the, the uh, field of high yield bond investing uh, in 1978, which is when I was lucky enough to move into that area. And it has worked uh, for 44 years. That doesn't mean there haven't been any losing years. But if you didn't sell on the downs, uh, most of the bonds came back and, you know, high yield bonds over the 44 years have had a much higher return than treasury bonds uh, uh, with low risk. Uh, and that's, that's what I think
constitutes the intelligent bearing of risk. You, you said you guys are neutral, something like neutral at Oak Tree, but neutral to spending, investing more, or neutral to more defensive? No, our no. We're, the answer is aggressive. when we're neutral, that means we're doing both. We're 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 investing every day, but but with a uh, but we always include an element of defense okay. in what we do because we always look for what we call margin of safety. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that we are going to make good money if things go as we hope. Margin of safety is what permits you to be okay if things don't go as we hope. And we always insist on a margin of safety. But, you know, sometimes we're aggressive. We buy more eagerly and we don't insist on so much margin because we don't think it's needed because we're getting such bargains. Sometimes we buy defensively because we think prices could be a little vulnerable and we insist on more uh, margin. And right now we're somewhere in the middle, neutral, as you say. Uh, and I think that's the right thing. And we keep a list of possible investment companies uh, based on you know, uh, uh, yields and spreads and depressed prices and uh, what we call interest coverage in our business. How many times uh, do, do the, does the EBITDA e cover the interest obligations? And we have that list. And like two months ago, it was this long. Today, it, it's, it, it's more than a full page. Great. So, you know, things, things have gone our way. When, when, you know, most people root for most people root for the market to go up. Uh, we kind of root for the market to go down because that is like putting hamburgers on sale, mm -hmm. and we'd like to buy more. But you know, the, the, this this goes back to what I my constant theme, Maria. It's folly to think you know what lies ahead. Most, you know, uh, another great quote from one of my heroes, John Kenneth Galbraith. He said, "We have two kinds of forecasters: the ones who don't know." And the ones who don't know, they don't know. <laughs> and, and I think he's right. If you could pick, what would be the three memos you are most proud of writing and would strongly recommend reading? There's a lot. And you had time to think about it, I guess. I'm going to give you four. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Number one, uh, as to cycles and investor psychology and investor behavior, I would recommend reading The Race to the Bottom, Great. which was written in February 07 when people were eager to invest. And we take that as a cautionary sign. And then The Limits to Negativism in October of 08, which I think was pretty close to the bottom. And that, that was when everybody was suicidal. And we take that as a sign to invest. So I think that those two memos taken together, only 20 months apart, give you an idea, you know, how, how, how psych, investor psychology changes. And I wrote in my memo on the couch, uh, I said, in the real world, things fluctuate between pretty good and not so hot. But in the markets, psychology goes from flawless to hopeless. And that's why the markets fluctuate so violently. And I think those, that, that taken together, those two memos will give you a, a sense for that. But then, two memos on kind of the fundamental principles of investing. Risk Revisited Again, which I think was in 2015, and it's everything I know about risk, and I think there's some really important stuff in there. And then, uh, 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 Dare to be Great too. That one talks about the fact that, you know, look, Investing is a funny area. It's really easy to do average. It's really hard to be above average. So it's, given the difficulty involved in being above average, it's not illegitimate, it's not dumb to say, you know what, I'll settle for average because average is pretty good. You know, 10% a year for the last 90 years is pretty good. Uh, settling for average, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you want to be above average, you have to dare to be great, which means you have to dare to be different from others second level thinking, and you have to be dare to be wrong. Because th there's nothing you can do that always works, and taking on additional risk in the pursuit of additional return isn't certainly going to work all the time, and, 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 and it may not work for you ever. So uh, I think it's, 
but, it, but this memo talks about if you want to be superior, that how, how, you, how to do it. And I'm going to add one more. Great. After, <laughs> afterthought. Make them five. At the, at, awesome. at, the, at the end of last year, I put out a memo called Selling Out. That was good. Because I don't think that, uh, I, think that I, I don't think enough attention is paid to the question of selling. You know, and if you, go to, if you go to university, like I teach at Columbia and Wharton a lot, and most of the teaching is about when to buy. Mm -hmm. Almost, I've, I've never heard of a lecture on when to sell. And I, as I said before, I think people sell too much. And I think psychologically they sell for two reasons, if it goes up or if it goes down. Mm -hmm. If it goes up, since people are driven by their psyches, they're afraid that the losses will disappear. So I better sell now. If it goes down, they say it could go down more. So they sell. These are bad reasons to sell. Uh, I think the, the reason to sell is you've done an analysis. You wouldn't buy it. You're convinced that it's not a purchase. Maybe it's a sale. But anyway, I, I, I hope people will read that one also. Awesome. Very good. Great. And I must say, I love the selling out memo. Good. It's, it's good. Thanks. Good and and yeah. uh, but if you wait a, a, a few months, uh, I think I'm planning on writing, selling out, revisiting. Aren't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> because I've had so many so many uh, additional thoughts since that one, and there, it's such a big topic that hasn't been treated. And Howard, if you could prepare a checklist for hiring a good manager to manage part of your money, can't be Oak Tree. No. <laughs> um, what are the essential items that you would be in that checklist? Uh, well, I mean, before I say that, uh, let me just say that there's no one answer to these questions for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. S for some people who want to, uh, who, who are willing to take a lot of risk in the hope of getting rich, they need somebody who's aggressive. Yeah. Hopefully, it's, it's intelligently. For someone who has all they need or more and they want to keep it and maybe increase it moderately, but not take a lot of risk, they need somebody who's defensive. But hopefully intelligently. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you have to, it, it, these, these things are, are hard to assess. And, you know, there are a lot of people, especially in the investment business, who sound very articulate, but are really no smarter than anybody else. So I, I don't, just like investing is easy, isn't easy, finding someone to trust isn't easy. Uh, but uh, I guess what I would say is we want people who think uh, logically, I like logic. Uh, I like people who, who understand the essence of second-level thinking. Who, 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 you know, if you if you say, well, what do you like about that company? I don't like people who say, well, this, this, this. I like people who say, the market doesn't understand that, or most investors overestimate this. That's so fundamental to investment success, and some people just understand that. And some don't. I like uh, I like uh, people who are risk conscious, who understand that we we buy based on what we think will happen, but it's not always going to happen. So we should think about well, what's going to happen if what I think is going to happen doesn't happen? Who think about the downside? I think those are the key fundamentals. Uh, of course, I think it's very important to. Uh, understand people who are over, uh, to avoid people who are overconfident. Uh, the English word is hubris, excessive pride. And, uh, you know, uh, the Mark Twain quote is the greatest. Uh, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for certain that just ain't true. In my opinion, I've been doing this for 53 years, I've been reasonably successful, I'm never confident. I'm never sure that what I think is going to happen is going to happen. Now, hopefully, I'm right most of the time. Hopefully, my conservatism is excessive, in which case we're going to make a lot of money. But the, the future is so uncertain, and the investment investing machine is so, it's, it's like you're playing chess against somebody who's really smart. It's, it, there is no room, in my opinion, for certainty in our business. I like people who express uncertainty. Uh, you know, uh, I, take un I take the acceptance of, uh, of uncertainty as a sign of intelligence, and, and I take expression of certainty 
as a as a sign of ignorance. Howard, uh, you have accomplished professional success, financial success, I would say even literary success, and you are globally recognized as one of the greatest investors in history. After so many achievements, uh, what drives you currently? What makes, makes you get out of bed every day? You know, Warren Buffett says that he skips to, m to work in the morning. <laughs> I skip to work in the morning, because you know why? It's fun. I work with great people. Oak Tree is full of people not just who can make a lot of money, but who are pleasant to associate with. I don't want to uh, spend my time with a bunch of uh, unpleasant people. Uh, we work as a team, and, and it's very harmonious, and it, there's not a lot of bureaucracy, and there's not a lot of politics. Um, but the, the great thing about investing is that it is a meritocracy. You know, uh, at the end of the year, there can be much debate over which was the best movie. There's not much debate over who performed the best. And, but sometimes the person who has the highest return got there through skill, sometimes through aggressiveness and luck. Mm -hmm. After 30 years, I think there's not much debate over who did a good job. And, uh, you know, I, I like working in that environment because uh, it's, it, there's no BS. So, Howard, uh, during your professional life, you have probably received or developed at least one or two great lessons uh, about investing that you consider very valuable and like to teach your interns or analysts. Uh, what is that lesson or lessons? You know, I have a long list of quotes that I use. I've used some of them today in this discussion. And I think that the, 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 the quotes and the adages, uh, the sayings, encapsulated so well and they, ha they have lasted uh, because they're so good. So I'll just talk to you about the, my three favorites. Uh, number three is that uh, being too far ahead of your time is indistinguishable from being wrong. And it doesn't mean you're wrong, but you know, if you, if you say, well, the market's too high, we're going to get out and it goes up for the next five years. You know, you may have been right in some intellectual sense at the beginning, but you got into trouble because it didn't happen. And so you must not think that the things that you think are gonna happen are gonna happen right away. And, and one of the things I say, and I, this is very important, this is the lesson of that, is it's sometimes we have a sense for what's gonna happen. We never know when. And, you know, and, and people should realize that, that overpriced and going down tomorrow are not synonymously. Yeah. Something can be overpriced and become more overpriced, more overpriced, mm -hmm. more overpriced. That's how we get bull markets. So they, nobody should bet that something which is overpriced is gonna go down in the short run or that something that's underpriced is gonna go up in the short run. That's number one, or it's number three. Number two, never forget the man who was six feet tall who drowned crossing the stream that was five feet deep on average. It is a mistake to think about surviving on average. We have to survive every day. And what does that mean? That means we have to survive on the worst days. So you have to put together a portfolio for yourself and a financial structure for yourself which will permit you to survive on the worst days. If you don't do that, when the bad day comes, if you're over levered, you can be bankrupt. If you don't have uh, enough money to pay your bills in cash, if you don't have a strong stomach, you may sell out at the bottom and miss this wonderful miracle of compounding. So you have to be, you have to have a portfolio that fits you and your circumstances and your psychological equipment so that you can survive the worst days. Number one, most important, what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. Every, it's not wrong to buy, it's not wrong to sell, it's not wrong to buy growth stocks, it's not wrong to buy value stocks, it's not wrong to buy bonds. For each one, there's a good time and a bad time. If you 
get there early, you understand that something has potential, that that potential isn't recognized by everybody, that the thing is reasonably priced, and that even though it has no friends, you're willing to participate and run the risk of being early. That's what the wise man does, he buys in that stage. But eventually, if the thing performs well for five years, the price quadruples. Now everybody thinks it's great. If you don't have it, you're an idiot. It can never fail. It can never have a bad day. The person who buys then is the fool, and, and that fool can lose a lot of money. So uh, watch the trends. When the trends are getting their start, it could be a good idea. When they've gone on for too long, it's a bad idea. So clearly it's not what you do, it's the price at which you do it. And you know, in 1978, when I switched from stocks, where the experience had been very bad because the banks in those days bought the Nifty 50, which collapsed in the 70s, I switched to, to bond investing. I was buying, investing in high yield bonds, uh, very low rated securities, making money safely and dependably. So I concluded it's, it's, it's not what you buy, it's what you pay. There's a right time and a wrong time. And uh, that's why the, the, the adage that what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end is so important. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to leave you with those three. Awesome. Amazing. Howard. Thank you very Thank much you, for your time. Pleasure, man. Thank you so much, Howard. It was a great episode. And whenever you decide to, to go to Brazil, you'll be pleased to, to buy you a good feijoada. Very good. And thank you, Mari, for, for joining me. In thank this you for the invitation. Here. Uh, it's been a, an amazing experience. And well, thank you so much I, for our I, listeners. And, I, and I'm always happy to work with XP. Awesome. We, we, we enjoy a very uh, constructive relationship. I look forward to its continuation. Great, great. And thank you for being with us until the end. See you next time.